Those of you who are unfamiliar with this debate, please forgive me because now I'm going to maybe raise some questions in your minds that you've never had before. But um, I am speaking on this topic in light of what we're going to look at this evening because there's really not going to be anyone to take the, the other side. And again, Godfrey, uh, Dr. Godfrey is, is simply um, reporting historically what's happened. He gives his opinion. He does talk a little bit why, you know, the reasons why he holds to the position that he does, but we do need to recognize that uh, the vast majority of the church is using hymns and instruments, and we need to ask the question, are they doing what's right or wrong? Well, um, just because they're using hymns, I would suggest, and just because they're using instruments doesn't mean they're wrong. There are certain instruments, perhaps, there are certain hymns, maybe that shouldn't be used. You know, that, that's true as well. But um, certainly we should sing the Psalms, and that's something that Godfrey, Dr. Godfrey is going to remind us of this evening. But let me just start with a little bit of review. Remember, so far in our Reformation series, and I'm just saying these things to try to bring into your minds some of the things we have looked at. We've seen, remember how the Reformed churches in the, in, in the 16th century, right? when you have the Reformed churches forming and in the 17th century, now you've got more than one church, and we saw how they had to wrestle with how to deal with churches that differed with them, you know, because being united one church and now having a variety of them, people doing different things with different convictions. So we saw how that was worked out. We saw how they responded to the questions that were raised through a renewed Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, even the questions of the Anabaptists and Socinians, through a movement called scholasticism. And uh, Calvin was considered a part of scholasticism. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was, uh, Francis Turretin. Uh, and we have benefited from the answers to those questions as they delve more deeply into the scriptures. We saw their efforts to engender and strengthen genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for God through preaching, uh, heartfelt preaching and preaching to the heart, Bible study, and Sabbath, Sabbath observance, something which, again, Dr. Godfrey reminded us of is all but disappeared today. But something very important, we need time with God. And last week, how their conviction that the magistrate is itself to be subject to the law, and I think they would argue not just the law of the land, but also the law of God, led to the English Civil War and the execution of Charles I. And we kind of wrestled with the question, is, is that, was that right? Should they have done that, you know? Well, again, think about what we looked at last week. Well, this evening, Dr. Godfrey is going to speak on the Puritan view of church government very briefly, and that within Reformed churches is really not disputed today. But two other issues that are worship and eschatology. Now, we obviously don't have time to deal with those three topics in one, one message this morning. And since we've, um, you know, again, there's really no debate on the, on the Presbyterian uh, form of government that came out of this, although there are those who would debate that. Uh, and since we've just recently gone through a study on eschatology, actually quite in depth, we're going to focus on the worship aspect. Now, what we're going to be told this evening, and it's absolutely true, that the Reformed and Puritan churches strongly held to a position called exclusive psalmody, and that's what really I'd like to call into question uh, this morning. Otherwise, we're going to have to toss out our hymnals and, and go to a psalter, right? And the question is, should we? Because we don't want to just do one thing or the other because that's what we feel like. Or we like singing hymns and we don't want to get rid of them. We like Isaac Watts and we like John Newton. We like Charles Wesley uh, and their hymns. But we really need to have a conviction based upon God's Word. Now, when we think of the Reformation, sometimes we forget about a principle of the Reformation that the Reformers taught, and that is called the Continuing Reformation. Their motto was reformed and always reforming. And remember, reforming simply means looking at the Scriptures, examining what we're doing, what we're believing, and bringing everything into conformity with what the Word of God says. That's what it means to reform something. Now, just, they, you know, they knew, let's just say in their day, they knew that they hadn't done it all. 
you know, that they hadn't reformed everything that needed to be reformed. There was still work to be done. But perhaps one thing that they didn't realize is maybe some of the convictions they held to needed also to be reformed. And I realize that that's um, kind of a, uh, could, could sound rather arrogant, and we do have to be careful when we go against the reformers, and, and I would say especially uh, the Puritans. Now, first of all, let's remember there are certain things that they believed, certain things they taught that, that came to the forefront during the Reformation that will never need to be reformed. And that would include, of course, the gospel, you know, the, the five solas of the Reformation, that Scripture alone is our authority, that Christ alone is our mediator, that justification is by grace alone apart from works. And to be by grace alone, it must be received by faith in Christ alone, and that's how God alone receives all the glory. That, that's the gospel. That we, you know, there are people who contradict that, but they do to their own peril. Now, again, we are indebted to the Reformers and to the Puritans for so much, so very much of our biblical understanding. But that doesn't mean that what they taught was right in every area, that it doesn't need reforming. They believed, as I mentioned before, that only psalms should be sung. Only inspired songs should be used in public worship. I'm going to give you a quote from Calvin to that effect. There are some Presbyterian and Reformed denominations today that continue to hold to that position. But the question is, are they right? Okay. I want us to consider from our passage this morning that God also calls us to sing beside the psalms, I'm not saying we don't sing the psalms, but beside the psalms, that we need to sing new songs, hymns that glorify God in His continuing work through the Lord Jesus Christ and His church. Now, let me begin by just considering briefly why some believe in exclusive psalmody. It's because of the regulative principle Okay, that we are to worship God only as God commands. And by the way, that is absolutely true. That is something we agree with. Only God can tell us how He wants to be worshipped and how He should be worshipped. So, what does He tell us? Well, nobody questions that He calls us to sing. The psalmist writes in Psalm 9, verse 11, Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples His deeds. Paul writes in our passage, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We know He wants us to sing. Uh, one question we don't often ask but I thought would be very helpful for us this morning is to ask the question, why? Why does God want us to sing? Now, we might think that the answer to that question is because, because God needs for us to sing or he's, he, he really is enriched by our singing. But again, remember that God is already infinitely blessed and what we do is not going to increase his blessedness, although it does increase that of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is also man as well as God. But Jonathan Edwards would argue it's not so much because he needs it, but it's because we need it. Now listen to what Edwards writes in his Religious Affections in a book that I'd recommend that all of us read, but again, very searching book. He says this, the duty of singing praises to God seems to be appointed wholly in, 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 in its entirety to excite and express religious affections. No other reason can be assigned why we should express ourselves to God in verse rather than in prose. You know, use poetry rather than just straightforward language. And to do it with music but only that such is our nature and frame that these things have a tendency to move our affections. Now, by affections, Edwards is not really just referring to emotions. There's a lot of music that can move emotions in a lot of different directions. But what he's referring to is the love that the Spirit of God has given to us for God. Singing moves the heart 
and focuses our desires upon God. So he wants us to sing, and he wants us to sing to stir up our affection, our love for him. Again, that love the Spirit of God gives us. And there's also no question that he wants us to sing psalms. Again, he says as much in our passage. But Calvin, again, one of the, that we think of as perhaps the main reformer that has to do with the churches that, that we're involved in, he writes this as to why we should sing psalms. And this is from his preface to the Genevan Psalter of 1543. We should have songs that are not only upright but holy, that will spur us to pray to God and praise Him, to meditate on His works so as to love Him, to fear Him, to honor Him, and glorify Him. For what St. Augustine said is true, that, no, uh, that, excuse me, that one can sing nothing worthy of God save what one has received from him. Wherefore, though we look far and wide, we will find no better songs, nor songs more suitable to that purpose than the Psalms of David. By the way, I should mention that there was the belief during the time of the Reformers and the Puritans that all the Psalms were written by David. Um, not sure exactly why, especially when there are titles that show that there were other authors, but uh, you'll even see that in Spurgeon, okay? There's no better song, uh, songs nor songs more suitable to the purpose, worshiping God, than the Psalms of David, which the Holy Spirit made and imparted to him. Thus, singing them, we may be sure that our words come from God just as if he were to sing in us for his own exaltation. Wherefore, Chrysostom exhorts men, women, and children alike to get used to singing them, so as through this act of meditation to become as one with the choir of angels. Okay, so we are to sing. We are to sing to stir up affections. We are to sing psalms. But the question we want to ask this morning from the scriptures, we want to answer it from the scriptures, is whether or not we are to sing only psalms. Now, let's begin by kind of doing a brief historic survey of, in the Bible itself to see if there were songs that were sung other than psalms, okay? Now, it's interesting to think about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but what about in the garden? Did Adam and Eve worship God in song? Now, we're not told. We'd have to speculate here. But considering, you know, their particular state and the pure love they had for the Lord in the garden, it's hard to imagine that they didn't. And what about after they were expelled from the garden? Did they worship the Lord in song? Did their children worship the Lord with song? Again, it's hard to imagine that they didn't and that song only came, uh, you know, came later, especially when we do see that God gave to certain children of Adam, although in the line of Cain, we have to kind of take that into account, he gave them the ability to make instruments so that they could play music. And the question is, why? Why would they want to? Well, it's a gift given by God, music, and used to praise Him, most likely. Now, there, there were those who did worship the Lord, clearly, in Job's day. Elihu, who was one of Job's counselors, remember, and a contemporary with Abraham, said to Job, in Job 36, 24, remember that you should exalt his work of which men have sung. Okay, so there was singing going on in his day, and here we're still talking about uh, pre-Psalms, pre-Psalter, but perhaps, um, no, actually there weren't any exceptions. Even the earliest one had not been written by that point, okay? Now, there are also in Scripture references to other compositions used in worship that followed certain events, and I want us to pay attention to this because I think this is key. And just let me give you some examples first. Moses composed a song for Israel when the Lord delivered them from the Red Sea. Remember Exodus 15, the entire chapter is practically a song, and I don't think it was one that Moses uttered spontaneously, but one he composed for the children of Israel to sing. He composed another when the Lord provided them with water in the wilderness, and still another that would serve as a witness against them when they would later fall from the Lord in Deuteronomy 32. He wanted them to sing it so that they would be reminded that they were warned ahead of time, that they were going to fall away from the Lord 
when they entered into the land. Deborah and Barak wrote a song when the Lord gave them victory over uh, Jabin and Sisera in Judge, Judges 5. Songs were written about David and his victories, 1 Samuel 21, 11. David wrote a lament that he commanded the children of Judah to sing in 2 Samuel 1, 17 through 27. Hezekiah composed songs to praise God for God's healing him of his affliction. He says in Isaiah 38, verse 20, the Lord will surely save me. So we will play my songs on stringed instruments all the days of our life at the house of the Lord. And yet all of these songs that I've just referred to, none of these, I should say, were actually included in the Psalms, and yet they were used in public worship. Now, the point that I wanted to make from these examples is this. They were simply doing what God commanded them to do in the Psalms, okay? And something which, which appears to be instinctively understood by the people of God, but something explicitly commanded by God in the Psalter. In Psalm 33.3, we read this, sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy, and in our call to worship, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Now, what, what is this idea of a new song that he's referring to? Well, from these examples and, and from what the words mean literally, when the Lord delivered his people, when he showed them some special mercy, he called on them to compose a song to commemorate it so that future generations might remember and praise him for it. Now, that's exactly why most of the Psalms were actually written. They are written from the experience of God's people when they're going through difficult times or when the Lord delivers them or when they're going through difficult times and they promise God that if he delivers them, that they will come and worship him. They're there to fulfill that vow to him. So the Psalms are composed in the context of the Lord doing these wonderful things that they wanted to sing about. And I guess the question we should ask is, um, does it stop with the Psalms or does it continue? Can you think of anything the Lord has done since the completion of the Psalms that we should be singing about? I mean, what about Christ's birth? What about his life? What about the things he taught? What about his death and his resurrection, his ruling and his reigning and his coming again? You know, we actually have examples in the New Testament of hymns that were written during New Testament times being sung in the churches. At least that's, you know, the belief. What Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3.16 is considered by New Testament scholars to be an early hymn, although we read it and we say, well, it's very poetic. Uh, was that something that they were reciting, or is it something they were singing? Quote, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let me just point out the obvious. That's referring to Christ, and that's something that you could not have composed from the Old Testament Psalter. You know, it may be hidden there in shadows, but it's not explicit like this. And there are some things that are revealed in the New Covenant that weren't revealed in the Old Covenant. And in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, it is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And listen to this example from Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And though this may be taking place in heaven, it's still a song worshiping God for a new work that he is doing. And again, there's some question about what the book of Revelation is referring to. Uh, some of you may know my position on that, but this makes perfect sense. And in 14 verse 3, regarding the 144,000, and here's where my position kind of comes out, this is speaking about the redeemed Jews from the tribes of Israel that God would save 
before he brings judgment upon Israel in 70 AD. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Well, the point is that there are new songs being composed that are based upon the continuing work of God through his work of redemption. And what about the things that have happened since that time? The Reformation, the Great Awakening, the mercies that he shows his saints. I mean, have you seen any of the hymns written that were written by some of his people in, you know, going through very difficult circumstances? I think about uh, the one, is it Horatio Spafford, something like that, I forget his name exactly, but, um, you know, it is well with my soul. And he writes from the experience of his wife and his, his family, his daughters on a ship that had sunk. And in the midst of that difficulty and that, you know, that loss, he can write, it is well with my soul. And we can use that hymn as well to enter into something of what he was experiencing or at least to express what we're experiencing when we go through something similar. You know, shouldn't we write new songs to praise God for these things. Now, I think that's what Paul had in mind when he tells us that we should sing not only the Psalms, but also hymns and spiritual songs. Now, A.T. Robertson, who is um, perhaps arguably the greatest Greek scholar who ever lived, and his focus was on New Testament Greek, writes that hymns refer to praises to God composed by Christians like 1 Timothy 3.16, which we just read, and that spiritual songs is a general description of all such compositions, whether with or without instrumental accompaniment. Okay, so that's what he believes that Paul is referring to. Now, those who hold to exclusive psalmody believe that psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are actually referring only to psalms. All of these things refer just to psalms. And the reason is because in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, these designations are given to different types of psalms, okay? We have to understand that that is the case. But is that what Paul's referring to? Because those words can be used for other things. Well, here are the, here's the problem with that view. None of the psalms are actually called spiritual songs. They may be called songs, psalms, hymns, and songs, but not spiritual songs. There are several other types of psalms, in the Septuagint or titles or designations given to them outside of these three terms that he uses here. And then whenever the Psalms are referred to in the New Testament, they're either called by the title of the book itself, the book of Psalms, or Psalms, so to speak, just Psalms, or simply two individual Psalms. But that threefold designation is not used to refer when they want to refer someone to the Psalms. In other words, Paul should have said something to this effect, you know, that we should worship or worship the Lord with Psalms or from the book of Psalms and not added those other two designations. Now, let me give you a couple more arguments Jonathan Edwards provides that I think are compelling. And these are from reason, okay? Um, and they're based on Scripture, but, um, but they're not directly addressed in Scripture. First of all, he reminds us of what hymns are. I mean, what, what are hymns? They are prayers, okay, that, that are being offered to God in, again, in meter, um, in verse, in, and accompanied by music, right? Now, he points out that God doesn't limit us in our prayers, as we're just simply praying to the language of Scripture. So why would he make that limitation when it comes to our singing of these praises, which are also prayers? Listen to what he says. But what is more especially found fault with in the singing that is now practiced is making use of hymns of human composure. He's saying that you know, people are complaining against the use of hymns. You know that Isaac Watts, when he, he wrote the first hymns being used in Reformed churches, they accused him of being demon-possessed because he wrote hymns, okay? So what are they finding fault with? Well, this, he goes, um, I am far from thinking that the book of Psalms should be thrown by in our public worship. 
but it should, that it should always be used in the Christian church to the end of the world. But I know of no obligation we are under to confine ourselves to it. I can find no command or rule of God's Word that does any more confine us to the words of the Scripture in our singing than it does in our praying. We speak to God in both. And I can see no reason why we should limit ourselves to such particular forms of words that we find in the Bible in speaking to Him by way of praise in meter and with music than when we speak to Him in prose by way of prayer and supplication, close quote. I think that that's a valid argument. Why would God limit us in one but not in the other? And when we pray, the Puritans and the Reformers were very much in favor of extemporaneous prayers. You know, don't pray out of a prayer book, but pray as the Spirit of God leads. Okay? But here's a second argument that I think is perhaps even more compelling. Why would God require us to sing worship to Him under the shadows of the Old Covenant when we have the clearer light of the New Covenant? Listen to what he writes again. He says this, and is it, or excuse me, and it is really needful that we should have some other songs besides the Psalms of David. It is unreasonable to suppose that the Christian church should forever, and even in times of her greatest light, in her praises of God and the Lamb, be confined only to the words of the Old Testament, wherein all the greatest and most glorious things of the gospel that are infinitely the greatest subjects of her praise are spoken of under a veil, and not so much as the name of our glorious Redeemer ever mentioned but in some dark figure or is hid under the name of some type. You know, does it make sense then that God would have us to speak of Christ under the veil when he's been unveiled and we have seen him, okay? And we can't really technically even use his name because it doesn't appear in the Psalms. Now, again, we can draw one final argument from the fact that the church has sung hymns throughout our history, okay? We saw that was the case in the New Covenant church. If you look in the hymnals, you'll find that there are hymns included there that have been written throughout the centuries. We have one that is dated 200 A.D. One of, our most, uh, one of the most famous hymns ever written was written during the, the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress is Our God by Martin Luther. And this simply shows us that a large segment of the church has believed that the writing and singing of hymns is really what is pleasing to the Lord. So again, the argument is, sing to the Lord a new song when God does new and wonderful things. We should praise Him for those things, not only in our prayers, but in our praise. And to do that, we need new compositions. Okay. Now let me just close with three Final points, one of them having to do with instrumentation. First of all, just because we're authorized to sing new songs to the Lord, that doesn't mean that any song that's composed should really be sung to the Lord. It doesn't mean that anything goes. Okay, let me just mention briefly, the songs we sing should be true. We need to sing the truth and not error. They need to be biblical. They need to be God-honoring. And I think they should follow the example that we have in the Psalms. Okay, the Psalms are wonderful examples. Secondly, instruments. Okay, that question is going to be raised this evening. Does the regulative principle, only what God commands in worship, to be used in worship, allow us to use musical instruments? Now, Calvin argued that since instruments were a part of the old covenant worship, that they're no longer valid for new covenant worship. We don't have a fresh command to use instruments in our worship now, well, we do have to recognize that there are parts of Old Covenant worship that continue into New Covenant worship. They prayed in the Old Covenant. We should pray in the New. They read and explained the Word of God. They used sacraments, and we do as well. Just because the New Covenant has come does not mean that these things have all necessarily passed away. The strongest argument for the use of instruments may be that which comes from the Psalms themselves, which encourage us over and over again 
to worship the Lord with instruments. We, we read in Psalm 33, give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, which is a stringed instrument. <laughs> Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. And in Psalm 150, verses 5 and 6, praise him with stringed instrument and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. I guess we better bring some cymbals to church next week. And Anyway. The harp and the lyre are often mentioned in the Psalms. Um, several of the Psalms contain this direction for the choir director on stringed instruments. In other words, this Psalm is to be accompanied by these particular instruments. Now, an argument could be made that when God put something into force, when he says, do this, that it remains in force until he says, don't do it, okay? That's one of the principles that we should use in understanding how we cross from the old covenant into the new. How do we know what stays behind and what it is that continues? Well, if God has not specifically abolished it, then we should continue it. Why don't we offer sacrifices? Why don't we go through all that priesthood and the ceremonial system and so forth? Well, it's because we know Christ has fulfilled it all. He's made the last for all sacrifice. He is our great high priest. And now we are priests and kings to him in his, in his church. Okay, so we know those things have been fulfilled and we don't do them anymore, but what about the Ten Commandments? Well, thankfully, they're all repeated in the new covenant as well, so there's no question regarding that, although there's still questions regarding the fourth commandment nonetheless, but they continue. There's a lot that does continue. God's morality continues and so forth, and we don't necessarily need him to repeat it. There are some who would say only those things repeated, only those things that are spoken of in the new covenant continue. Well, there is continuity between the old covenant and the new and there are things that do come across, and they may not specifically be mentioned. So I think this, the, the way we should view it is God has to set it aside. Well, he commanded the use of instruments in worship, and I don't see any place where he's set those aside. You know, it is interesting, too, that just about everybody who argues against using hymns and using instruments in public worship will use hymns and instruments in their private worship, you know, and, and that's, that's strange. I remember going to a um, general assembly that was being hosted on the campus of a denomination that believes in exclusive psalmody and, and no instruments, and that would be the RPCNA, Geneva, no, was, was it Geneva? I think it was Geneva College. And I was listening to one of the professors who was hosting us in his house. He was playing some hymns, and it was accompanied by music. And I, I said, uh, you, you can listen to this? I thought you guys were against this. And he says, only in public worship. So I said, well, if it doesn't please God in public worship, why would it please him in private worship? Well, we just believe because he hasn't commanded it in public worship that we don't do it in public worship, but, but he hasn't commanded that we don't do it in private worship. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. There's no consistency there. So I think actually a happy inconsistency that he was listening to hymns and he found them edifying, found, found them to stir up his affections and uh, to helped him to worship the Lord. Okay, finally, just a brief note on the style of music. The accompaniment should be suitable to the content, right? If it's celebrative, then it should be celebrative music, joyful, thoughtful, somber, and perhaps one of the most important points, it should support and draw attention to the lyrics and not overpower the lyrics, okay? Uh, and it should stir, stir up spiritual affections and not sinful emotions. Is anybody here aware of music that can stir up sinful emotions, maybe get you agitated or, you know, music can do a lot of things and the reformers and the Puritans are very much aware of that. And so they were very careful about what kinds of tunes that they would use. I remember going to an evangelistic outreach uh, held by a Calvary chapel years ago when I was in a Calvary chapel. Uh, 
and they had these bands playing on the stage before an evangelist would come out and speak, and these guys were just wailing away on their instruments, and you could not understand a word they were saying. You couldn't even hear what they were singing over the instrumentation, and yet it was meant to be a means of drawing the crowd in, and maybe it did draw them in, but it was supposed to bring a message across too, and it, it, it just failed in that. that. That's not what the Lord wants. You know, sadly, that can happen also in Reformed churches. I, I attended a Reformed worship service one time where the organ music was so loud, I could not hear myself singing. You know, everybody was trying to sing loud enough to be heard, but we were just overwhelmed by the, by the pipe organ. So anyway, just, just got to make sure that it supports the singing and doesn't overwhelm the singing or draw our attention to anything else but the Lord. So in conclusion, knowing that we may sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, what we really need to focus on is, is this, that we sing them in a way that is honoring to the Lord, that we don't just you know, sing, uh, you know, we like, just like we're, our prayers or listening to sermons, you know, I, I listened, I've done it, I've done my duty, or I've, I've closed my, my ears or my eyes, I should, not your ears hopefully, but your eyes, and in prayer you've been following along, but our hearts need to be engaged. When we are worshiping the Lord, in, either in, you know, in the sermon or in the prayers or as we come to the table, or in our praises, <clears throat> we need to make sure that our affections, our hearts are involved and that we really are loving Him. We really are worshiping Him and expressing to Him all the love that is in our hearts for Him and not just going through the motions. Remember what Dr. Godfrey talked about when he talked about Puritan piety. They were always concerned that the congregation was only going through the motions and their hearts were not really engaged. Well, that's not something you can, you can really guarantee. Any one person can guarantee. It's, it's a responsibility that each of us have to make sure that we are engaged in our worship. Well, may the Lord apply this to us and help us to, to benefit from it and to grow from, uh, again, this instruction from His Word. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And as we're praying, let's also pray the Lord would prepare us to come to the table.